Hi, I'm Mawan Tilienenge, and I'll be talking about my paper titled Flow Behavior of Carbon Dioxide Stimulated Geothermal Systems. So throughout the presentation, I'll be talking about geothermal energy and its potential application of carbon dioxide into geothermal systems and why it is carbon dioxide and what we did and what we have found. So starting with global energy demand. So as we all know, the world population is growing fast and as a result, the world energy demand is increasing rapidly in multiple aspects such as industry, transport, residential and commercial and so and so on. So to address this growing energy demand, a significant increase in world energy production was observed in last few decades. So among other renewable energy resources, renewable energy has obtained its attention in past few decades. So geothermal energy has been identified as a major source of this renewable energy due to its immense potential, low carbon dioxide emission, and as an environmental friendly option. So let's talk about the potential of this geothermal energy. As we can see in this map, a large area of Australia is underlaid by hot rocks. So the statistics of Geoscience Australia says that if we can exploit at least 1% of this geothermal energy, we will be able to provide Australian energy needs for next 25,000 years. So how big this potential is. So how to exploit this potential? So geothermal systems are developed for this and are two types, conventional and unconventional geothermal systems. So conventional geothermal systems are developed to store, exploit heat stored in shallower depths while unconventional geothermal systems use engineering techniques to extract heat stored in deep earth. So enhanced geothermal systems or EGS is one such type and I'm focused in EGS. So in EGS, we inject a high pressure fluid into deep earth. So this high pressure flowing fluid has the ability of opening up uh, natural flow plants in deep earth and get heated by extracting heat from surrounding hot rock formations. And this heated fluid is again transported back to the earth's surface for energy extraction. So why this technology is challenging? As per the experience from past few projects, the, uh, they say that it is challenging because of low fluid flow rates and low heat extraction rates. And it is very difficult to create this underground reservoir. And there is a larger requirement for this injection fluid and in long-term aspects, there is a considerable dissolution and precipitation of rock minerals, which creates short circuiting and formation plugging. So, and also like there is a higher fluid loss from the circulation system into deep earth. So current technology is to use water as the circulation fluid in EGS. And the experience of Cooper Basin Project Australia says that for one stimulation event, that means for one fracturing event, they have used a water volume equivalent to eight Olympic sized swimming pools. So how big the water requirement is. So why do we inject our precious resource into deep earth? Let's replace this water by carbon dioxide. This is my main concern. So why it is carbon dioxide, not something else? We can earn carbon credits for storing greenhouse gases, and that is the main advantage. And also it is good in long-term stability and the enhanced flowability of this carbon dioxide results a lower power consumption for the operating plant. And in what happens to this carbon dioxide at extreme reservoir conditions, that means at high temperature and high pressure conditions which prevail in deep earth, this CO2 behaves as a supercritical carbon dioxide. What this supercritical carbon dioxide means? So its phase gets transit, uh, it's happened phase transitions of CO2 happens above its critical point. That means it flows like a gas, but acts as a fluid. 
So what we don't know about carbon dioxide uh, stimulation. So we don't know whether the supercritical carbon dioxide has the ability to create deep underground reservoir. And if it has the ability to create this reservoir, we don't know about its flow behavior. And mainly this supercritical carbon dioxide is more effective than water. These are my concerns. So what did I do? I tested the fracturing ability of supercritical carbon dioxide at high temperature and high pressure conditions prevailing deeper. For that, I use this advanced triaxial setup available at 3G Deep Laboratory, Monash University. So what I did was I, create, I made cylindrical rock specimens using granite and I made a well bore in this granite rock specimens and I injected supercritical carbon dioxide into this granite specimens at high temperature and high pressure conditions. So, and I monitored the increase of this fluid injection pressure with time. And what happens with the time is the pressure, pressurization of this injection fluid in, uh, causes the increase in pressure of fluid and it gradually increases up to a peak value and suddenly drops down due to fracture initiation. The creation of new flow paths results in reduction of this injection pressure suddenly after breakdown. So I did a series of fracturing tests under different pressure and temperature conditions with these results, we can predict the breakdown pressure. That means the pressure required in creating underground fractures at any temperature and any pressure conditions. And also I examined the microstructure of these induced fractures using CT scanning. Uh, and I used the Australian synchrotron facility, CT imaging facility for this. So what happens in fracturing? As you can see in here, supercritical carbon dioxide being a low viscous fluid, it has the ability to percolate into microfractures in granite and the pressurization of these microfractures creates an extended, more, uh, more extended fracture network in granite. So, but in water being a high viscous fluid, it doesn't have that flowability. And therefore like pressurization of a single flow path creates a single plane fracture in water fracturing. So in supercritical uh, fracturing, we has the ability of creating more extended multiple fractures in granite while water creates single plane fractures in granite. So, uh, what we found was like supercritical carbon dioxide has the ability to generate an extended more interconnected fractures with low energy compared to water. So this results creation of high fluid flow rates and high heat extraction rates through granite using this supercritical carbon dioxide. So what does this all mean finally? So our experiment shows that supercritical carbon dioxide has the ability to create an extensive fracture network with multiple narrow fractures compared to water. And we examine its mass flow rate, that means fracture permeability under different temperature and pressure conditions. Our result shows that the fracture permeability of the granite specimens fractured using supercritical carbon dioxide is more than 10 times higher compared to water fractured specimens at similar temperature and pressure conditions. So these higher fracture permeabilities and higher mass flow rates results in higher heat extraction rates. So this is very beneficial for us. And also our further study shows that for supercritical carbon dioxide fracturing, we create low seismicity and that is an additional advantage. And mainly we can store carbon dioxide in deep earth uh, in, during long-term operation of these enhanced geothermal systems. So with these all benefits, why do we inject our precious resource into deep earth? Let's replace it by super carbon dioxide while achieving sustainable development goals for clean energy and climate action. Thank you.